two things before we get going. First, there is a section of this video where I talk about sexual assault and bodily autonomy. I don't know if what I cover will affect anybody who has trauma related to these topics, but just in case, I wanted to bring this up in advance. Second, and less critically, is spoilers. So far, all the videos have had spoilers for the game I've been talking about, but in this case, there are also some spoilers for the original StarCraft. So if that matters to you, then, uh, fair enough, I suppose. If you're good to keep going, then let's get started. Without being hyperbolic, this may just be my favourite game ever made. There are some I would consider roughly its equal, but nothing better than it. And annoyingly, it had to be the target of the worst remaster ever. Let's not worry about that for this video though. Not too much anyway. I was first acquainted with it when visiting some relatives on a holiday, and my cousin was playing what turned out to be the final mission of the campaign. Before that, I had played some RTS. I was particularly fond of one Impossible Creatures. But even then, from the first look at the screen, Warcraft 3 was special. Why? Lots of stuff. Starting with the character portraits, which I later learned were taken from StarCraft. I'd never seen an RTS game try to create this level of intimacy with your units giving you a constant feed of personality from whatever you had selected at a given time. I also liked all the abilities that I could understand at the time, from bear form to raise dead, and let's not forget the giant bugs, falling stars and walking trees filling up the play space. In addition, I was weirdly interested in the references to upkeep that kept appearing on the screen. I didn't know what it meant, but it seemed cool. Everything about it bled with intrigue, passion, and excitement. Here we are, almost 20 years on, and, in the original version of the game, that feeling still remains. So how did this happen? Good as Warcraft 2 was, it's so far from the level of polish and detail we see in this installment. Why is there such a gulf between them? To start with, a lot of time had actually passed in the interim. Last we saw of the series was Beyond the Dark Portal in 1996. Reign of Chaos didn't pop up for purchase until 2002, which means that Blizzard had more than doubled its age in the time away. The biggest event in that time, as mentioned in the last video, was StarCraft, which not only sold really well, but immediately started making waves as people called it the best RTS ever made a reputation that it has maintained, at least among the lovers of the 90s RTS. This wasn't just earned on vague goodness either, it's attributed to the level of balance. Three factions with many viable strategies and units and yet no one of them outshined the others. No doubt a result of Rob Pardo's insistence on it being a point of focus, and then the long hard work the team put in to find the sweet spot before release, and then patching the buggery out of it afterwards. That begs the question, what to do with Warcraft now that StarCraft has hijacked its old position? The developers had a bit of a journey to find the answer. The first solution was Warcraft Adventures, Lord of Clans, taking the Warcraft universe into the realm of adventure games. This would follow the life of a young orc called Thrall as he escaped these human captors, reunited the Horde, and became the next war chief. However, by the time the game was ready, they felt the adventure genre had advanced too much and they had missed their window, so it was scrapped. Next came the idea of a roleplay strategy game that would be called Warcraft Legends, where you would control primarily a hero and a small number of units around them from a third-person point of view. After some time in development, it was found that this style of game didn't work very well from that perspective, so they brought the old isometric view back. From there, they slowly ended up bringing more of the old RTS features in until it was more of a new flavour of RTS rather than a new genre altogether. It was then renamed Warcraft 3, making it an official entry in the series. They still found a way to make the game its own though, for the heroes of Warcraft Legends remained the centerpiece of your army. 
To enhance this shift of focus, they made micromanagement far more important when compared to its predecessors and StarCraft. This has some interesting ramifications. More on that later, though. Like always, a cinematic cutscene will introduce the game, which in this case was also the game's cinematic trailer. This does a decent job of building the intrigue, but it gets outclassed almost immediately by this piece of art, just in case you thought there was any hope of you doing something else today. You'll see these signs of effort peppered all over the game, but effort has always been a staple of the series. What's different is the technology is now to a standard that that pepper is getting very thick indeed. It's almost impossible not to notice at least a few of the details. At the same time, you'll be discovering more of them with every playthrough, even decades later. To name a few examples, the druids of the Talon disappear like a Jedi when they die, the Paladin's book sports the signature of the artist, the ongoing gag between several units about this figure called Darkness, and you can repair bridges. One that I found myself that I've never seen mentioned online is in the Sentinels campaign. Maiev will stop saying, Illidan is out there somewhere. When you select her from Mission 4 onwards, reflecting the shift from searching for Illidan to fighting him. This is but a small taste of what there is. The YouTuber Abelhawk has meticulously gone through the game looking for them, and you can check out his videos if you want more. I just love that people even thought of these details, let alone went through the effort needed to include them in the game. Though, apparently it wasn't always welcome. When the cinematic team individually rendered a bunch of ants, that caused a bit of a ruckus. Similar to Warcraft 2 before it, Warcraft 3 allows you several ways to engage with its content depending on what type of player you are. Campaigns, melee vs AI, multiplayer, custom maps, and as of the expansion, custom campaigns, and on top of that a still very active and exciting pro scene. Let us not forget the world editor, the same editor the designers used to make the campaign maps. It was bloody impressive to start with and only got better with the expansion and patches. So powerful was the editor that Warcraft 3 might well be thought of as an entire game engine over just a game, and it's also intuitive enough that exploration and experimentation is encouraged for new users. I'll take this moment for the mandatory mention that the MOBA genre spawned from Warcraft 3. I won't even source that, you already know it's true. Shifting to the competitive front now, another thing Blizzard introduced in the six year gap between games was their online platform, Battle.net. So the experience was no longer focused on modem play, but through a convenient gaming service. Reign of Chaos also added anonymous automated matchmaking and the ladder, which greatly improved one's ability to grind out games and improve their skill, but perhaps at the cost of the social aspect. All of this proved to be a huge draw for many players. Indeed, the pro scene and the map maker scene are what kept Warcraft 3 alive during its Dark Ages around 2013. With that noted, for this video and the next I will mostly be focusing on the base campaigns and referencing the broader aspects of the game where appropriate through that lens. The game's first campaign is now a short dedicated tutorial, which had pretty much become standard for RTS in the latter half of the 90s. This will take you back to the Horde and, well hey, it's Thrall leading them. Just because his game was cancelled doesn't mean we're done with him. Thrall is warned about some vague threat of demons returning by a mysterious prophet who tells him to gather the Horde and set sail west, where another land known as Kalimdor can be found. Thrall, trusting the spirits around him, follows these instructions and leaves us to start the game proper with the humans. Their campaign begins with the court of Lordaeron receiving the same warning from the prophet, but not having convenient spirits telling them they should trust this warning, King Terranus tells the prophet to sod off. So instead, the humans decide they need to clean up the Blackrock clan, the last remaining orcs after the Horde's departure. A familiar face, Uther the Lightbringer, is sent to deal with this, accompanied by our first and most prominent protagonist, Prince Arthas. Odds are you know exactly who Arthas is now, but back in 2002, this little moment was the first time he had ever been seen. 
and he feels like a very standard, eager, fresh-faced, idealistic hero. With the small caveat that when he occasionally lets his guard slip, a very vengeful side comes out. Despite the tutorial campaign, the first building mission of each non orc campaign still operates as another one dedicated to the building and economic aspects of the race being played. This is needed because we have finally shed the old way of near-identical balancing. The humans and orcs are substantially different now, and if that isn't enough, we've got two more hanging around. The undead and the night elves. Again, we can thank Starcraft for this philosophical change. For Blizzard at least, if not the genre as a whole. Something interesting to note is that StarCraft's Terran, Zerg and Protoss did play something like how Blizzard intended, but it didn't work out that way this time. The four races were advertised like so. The humans are versatile and flexible. Orcs orient around powerful ground-based melee units. The undead will swarm the enemy to death with overwhelming numbers and the Night Elves rely on mobility, ranged attacks, and magic. Sounds nice, doesn't it? It's all wrong. Okay, one thing's sort of right. Humans are versatile, but not in the way you may be thinking. They are not able to just grab a strategy from a large pool at the start of the game. On the contrary, humans tend to require a more reactive approach. They can hard counter just about everything in the game very well, but their specialized units are also susceptible to being hard countered themselves. It's on you to make sure you have the right answer to your opponent and keep up with their decisions. Though when I say they are reactive, I mean in army composition. They can still be assertive tactically or economically. Night Elves are more what I think the humans were meant to be. They have many choices for army composition and lots of good power spikes to make use of. They're also the only faction where all your heroes are viable as a first hero, at least in some situations. On the downside, they are almost always outclassed if the opponent doesn't get too messed up by whatever surprises the Night Elves have in store. Incidentally, their most common strategy is mass late game melee, not ranged, so definitely ignore Blizzard's advice there. Ignore it even more with the undead, your strategies with them will not be about ramming huge armies into the enemy, but rather maintaining a small to medium sized army and microing it properly. Pretty much the opposite. The undead Crypt Fiend, Obsidian Statue and Destroyer mix with a Lich and a Death Knight army can defeat just about anything in the game. It can also lose to just about anything. It's up to how you control it to decide which. The best player in the world right now is Happy, an undead player who controls his army with such proficiency that it must be peak human. And finally, the orcs are fucking bull- Let's go over some other noteworthy changes now. All your units are far more expensive, which makes it impossible to produce them from a decent number of structures, unless you save up a lot of gold in advance. They are much tougher, so fights are slow and prior strategic positioning is not as vital or useful. The number of abilities that require you to actively use them mid-fight are a tad ridiculous if you intend on managing your macro elsewhere. The low population cap limits your army size to the point that you can't operate at multiple areas of the map at once, instead forcing you to have one large group of soldiers sticking together. Furthermore, we have the addition of heroes, units so powerful that deciding not to use them will be... Well, good luck with that. So, this sounds pretty bad, right? Except maybe the high number of abilities, but the other points are clearly against the game. Taking how we would play any previous Blizzard RTS, the game sounds slow, tedious, and having less variety. Okay, let's try that again through a different lens. The units are more expensive, so you are encouraged to manage their safety to avoid replacing them as long as possible. Thankfully, their increased durability means that minor mistakes will no longer cost you a serious number of them, or even one in most cases, so losing them is avoidable if you know what you're doing. The low pop cap prevents your armies from growing too large to be practically manageable, and the amazingly wide pool of abilities gives you a lot to occupy your APM. The new hero units can be a blessing or a curse. 
Acting as the centerpiece of your army, they can maximize its effectiveness if used correctly, but simultaneously if they die, your whole strategy can fall apart, giving you a critical weakness that must be attended to. What are all these changes saying? They are telling you to watch the fight. In the last games, it would often be better to let your units do their thing while you go set up extra production or economy, and only worry about micromanagement once everything else is in order. Reign of Chaos simply aims to reverse that dynamic. We see from this that the roots Warcraft legends planted have not been entirely dug up, just cultivated in a slightly different way. But of course, to be an RTS, you need more than just micro. To that end, there are still a good number of builds each race can execute. Indeed, I pointed out earlier that Night Elf's biggest strength relies on this. But none of them will work on strategy alone. Control is always vital in this game. That generally makes sense, but what about economy? Expanding to a new base takes time and is very vulnerable while being set up. In fact, even once it is set up, the expansion still acts as an extra weak point for your opponent to exploit. Thus any advantage it gives must be very potent or it will just end up being a liability. How can we make expanding worth it in this case without undermining the focus on micromanagement? In most RTS, an expansion translates to a production advantage, allowing you to outnumber your opponent, or to sustain for longer when armies are mashing together. Warcraft 3 instead needs to translate this to a tactical advantage which it does thanks to a little system I briefly mentioned at the start of the video, upkeep. Upkeep is a tax on your resources that occurs once you are above a certain population threshold. Low upkeep is 30% tax above 40 food, and high upkeep is 70% above 70 food. These thresholds were increased to 50 and 80 food respectively in the Frozen Throne. This is a little involved, so let me explain why this resolves the economy problem. Let's say you have two gold mines and your opponent only has one, but you both stay on 40 food in no upkeep. You don't really have much of an advantage in this situation, for any minor losses are not going to be so expensive that one base cannot cover them, and major losses are limited by your number of production buildings and not the gold you have reserved. Even if you use your expansion to double your production, it will not be fast enough at this point. So the expansion isn't doing much on no upkeep, but if we move into low upkeep, that's up to 70 food, you'll find that you're able to field your army and replace your minor losses just as before. Your opponent will be able to meet you at 70 food initially, but they won't have the income to keep up with those small losses anymore. Thus, if you are properly out microed, you will still lose. Micromanagement remains the queen, but it addresses your small mistakes, a few of which you are inevitably going to make, and stops them from snowballing out of control. Now let's get excited with this thought. Was what I've just described the intended effect of upkeep when the developers introduced it to the game? Yes, says Rob Pardo, who describes how players would just max out the pop cap and ram armies together without it. No, says David Freed, who describes how low-end PCs had performance issues when too many units were in play at once, so upkeep serves as a way of pulling the army sizes down. It's so cool when primary sources conflict like this. It leaves room for speculation and for further evidence to emerge. I haven't found any other evidence yet, but we'll see. Maybe one day. On the speculation, I'm inclined a little more towards Rob Pardo myself since he worked directly on the game's mechanics, while David Freed was a level designer, but more likely still is that there's a bit of truth in both stories. However, upkeep is controversial. Lots of players don't like it, and I can easily see why. It feels a bit off-putting to be losing resources all of a sudden when you're just building up an army like the game encourages you to, and the severe text that appears on the screen can be quite intimidating. I think it's obvious from how I've spoken so far that I approve of it in general, but I will agree that it didn't do the campaigns any favours, at least not how they were designed. The AI has infinite resources, strong defences and attacks with limited units. In these conditions, upkeep just makes you sit at home getting ready to attack for longer, drawing the missions out needlessly. 
A solution might be to remove upkeep for campaigns only, but there's a problem there that you won't have the experience with it when you start playing multiplayer. Though, we'll talk about how campaigns and multiplayer should relate to one another soon. All the same, I think upkeep is a very positive thing for the game overall. I've made a bit of a case here, but you can check the source for a more detailed and thorough case than I could ever make by Grubby, one of the best players in the game's history. We see now that there is a lot which is new to get used to in this game, but to accommodate this it gets you started in a relatively familiar environment. That is, we spend the first couple of missions with the old-fashioned humans and orcs fighting each other, serving both as an acclimation period to get used to these new mechanics, and to establish a sense of relative normality in Lordaeron before shit goes down. When it finally is time to start the story proper, we are introduced to a new race, the Undead, who are bolstering their army by spreading a plague across the land. We eventually learn that this is in service of a mass demonic invasion, but for now its ultimate aims are only told through cryptic statements. The second half of the campaign largely sees this mystery pushed to the background with a greater focus on Arthas himself, as he starts going to greater and greater extremes to end the undead threat once and for all. Arthas' descent first becomes obvious during The Culling, where he decides the solution to quell the plague of undeath is mass murder of a whole city. It's somewhat unclear if his logic here is sound. The writers don't really answer if the undead are actually dead and brought back, or sort of just mostly dead. If the former, then killing people isn't going to do much good, but if not, it should at least delay the scourge for a while. What is made clear is that he makes this decision without exploring alternatives at all, and he probably only did it as a way of getting back at Uther for a perceived slight, rather than a genuine belief that he was doing the right thing. His motives are reinforced mechanically by encouraging you to kill the villagers while they still live, for once they transform into undead units they are tougher and will start fighting back against your forces. We're not doing the map its full justice just by talking about the narrative though. Just as a level, it's very well designed. The intensity of the contest with Malganus forces you to optimize your strategy, which will naturally guide you to experimenting with the level's new unit, Knights. You'll have to manage slowing Malganus down, defending your base, secret hunting, and killing the villagers to play the map properly. It's not hard once you get used to it, but it does ask you to consider your priorities carefully. My only complaint is that it probably shouldn't have come right after another high-intensity mission like it does, just to give you some space to calm down. That would also have given a bit more time to flesh out Arthas' descent, as it does feel a bit too quick as is. But otherwise it's easily the best and most memorable moment of the campaign, and quite possibly of the whole game. Arthas then proceeds to do increasingly despicable things through the remainder of the campaign, until at the end he has effectively dropped the pretense of protecting his people, and outright admits it's about his own fulfillment through vengeance. He acquires a sword called Frostmourne that it's soon revealed corrupts its wielder, and when he is next face to face with his father, he executes the old man right in the middle of court, and then disappears for months. From there, the human campaign transitions straight to the undead one, without even shifting protagonist. This brings up the next lesson Warcraft learned from Starcraft, to tell one continuous story. The multiple timelines are a thing of the past. Probably for the best too, in a character-centric epic. Arthas returns as a new hero type, from Paladin to Death Knight, which is obviously designed to be the dark counterpart of the Paladin. For the record, the Death Knight is a far better hero overall. I think it's about time I discussed how heroes work in a little more detail. Essentially, they are a little RPG character in the middle of your RTS. They start at level 1 with pretty mediocre stats, but gain experience from killing enemies, and at certain thresholds they gain levels, improving their stats and granting you a new ability point. You can then spend these points to unlock new abilities, or upgrade one that you already have. Heroes will all have three abilities to choose from at level 1, that can then be upgraded at level 3, and again at level 5. Once you reach level 6, they can unlock their fourth and ultimate ability, which often lives up to its name, but sometimes is honestly worth ignoring. 
They can also carry items, some of which improve them statistically and some which can be consumed for a powerful instant effect. Testament to how well this system worked is that Dota pretty much left these fellows as they were, simply putting them in an arena against each other. For Warcraft 3, the final thing to note is that if they die, you can now revive them at an altar, the same building you originally summoned them from. Higher level heroes increase the cost and time to revive, so if you're gonna lose a hero, do it at level 1. That's the fly way. The altar's description makes it clear that it holds the souls of the faction's greatest champions when they die, so it is indeed bringing them back from the dead. Unless they die in a cutscene, apparently. The story just pretends altars don't exist. Heroes are an excellent addition to both online play and the campaigns, but how they affect your playstyles is quite different between the two. Blizzard treats their campaigns as practice for their online modes, to teach you the mechanics and rhythms of the game before you were thrown in the deep end versus another player. For StarCraft this sort of worked, though still not great really, but I wouldn't say it translated well to this game at all. The difference in how the two modes use heroes is our main issue here. To start with, you don't choose your heroes in the campaign, which in turn means you don't gain an understanding of what heroes are most sensible to go for at certain times. For instance, in the human campaign, your primary hero is a paladin. What you should have is an archmage in most cases. The reason for this is partly early game efficiency, but also because the Archmage can provide a mana regeneration aura to all your units, which is necessary for the mass spellcaster armies and the high levels of sustainability that characterize humans online. These aspects of the race are not awful without the hero, but they are far from their full potential during the campaign, at least on the maps where you don't have Jaina. Another problem is how your game plan is affected by the campaign's experience management. Online, hero experience is the most important resource for determining how the early game plays out. Most of the time you are either trying to hit a certain hero level as fast as possible, usually level 3, or you're trying to prevent your opponent from reaching such a level for as long as possible. If one player achieves their goal efficiently and the other does not, that can be the game right there. The campaigns will instead remember the hero's levels and items from map to map, so there isn't a huge push to optimize your creep routes and harassment. And the really tricky part to work out is that this is actually good for the campaigns. I mean, it would feel really dumb if Arthas just forgot everything every map and reset to level 1, but it completely divorces the campaign from how the early game works in multiplayer. Furthermore, some heroes just start at high levels, which can interfere with your understanding of their strengths and weaknesses. Take the Mountain King for instance. When you get one of these guys in the campaign, he is already level 5. If heroes were only level 5 and up, then I would say the Mountain King is at worst the second best hero in the game. You might just think that they are overpowered badasses from this alone, but once you realize how ineffective they are at level 1 and 2, it makes sense why they are not ubiquitous online. Despite these contradictions, I don't want them to change how the campaigns treat heroes. I think it is best to accept that the campaigns aren't the right vessel for learning the game's online style, and they should instead focus on being a compelling experience in their own right. I reckon this is what the developers went with when designing StarCraft II. Mind you, at least they do a good job of introducing you to the elements of each tech tree without being overwhelming. Now that I've covered the campaign's hero problem, I'm happy to say that the Undead campaign at least manages to dodge them. The first hero is the Death Knight, just like you would choose online, and you get practice with him at both low and high levels. The second hero is the Lich, again the correct choice from a multiplayer perspective. The Lich does start at level 5, but luckily this is a hero whose playstyle doesn't change much as you level them up. This is a good endorsement on the Undead campaign, but despite this, it's pretty disappointing after the human one. It's probably the weakest in the Reign of Chaos lineup. Part of the reason for this is lack of flexibility. The first three missions with a base all only have one truly viable strategy each. But the other, more important issue is that the story just isn't very compelling. 
While Arthas is a very strong character, I'd say the best Blizzard had made by this time. His arc is pretty much done by the end of the human campaign, and following that, all that's left is watching him methodically commit acts of violence. The events still serve a purpose for the wider narrative, but the focus is on getting stuff in the right place physically for the following campaigns and answering the mystery from the human campaign, with little to no time spent on character growth or exploring interesting themes. That is, it's telling a plot without telling a story. There are still a few standout moments though, like when Arthas confronts Uther again and the hint that the undead will rebel against the demons at some point. But if there is one worth exploring, it is the rivalry between Arthas and the elven ranger, Sylvanas Windrunner. This seemingly one-off conflict between them ends up being surprisingly infectious, largely due to her tenacity against overwhelming odds if nothing else. She lasts several missions and never relents in her resistance no matter how hopeless it gets. Despite fighting against her in gameplay, it's hard not to admire her strength and spirit. It's hard not to want her to win and how it ends is nothing short of horrific. When she is finally beaten and bleeding out on the floor, she commands Arthas to finish it, like he did for every other character he defeated, even Uther. But this time he decides to torment her further by invoking the power of Frostmourne to make her into a banshee, assimilating her into the Scourge. He stripped her very control of her body away and ultimately used it for his own ends. And worse, from a gameplay perspective, we are told to do exactly the same thing, without giving any time to dwell on the horror of what we've just seen. And worse still is that this is the second RTS in a row from Blizzard where they have done this to one of their strongest female characters. It's a very uncomfortable and pretty perverted use of something that has such a close analogy to rape. I find it hits even harder as we live now, 20 years later on, in a world where women's bodily autonomy is directly in the crossfire of regressives given the bullshit the US Supreme Court has pulled on abortion, and not to mention Blizzard's own sexual misconduct in the workplace. To be clear, I don't think the developers trivialized such a significant feminist issue on purpose. In fact, they were conscious enough to know that fridging female characters is bad. But how Sylvanas' treatment can come across seems to have gone completely over their head, and that says something about their priorities while writing and designing the game. It's particularly noticeable that Arthas and later Grom, men, chose to embrace what corrupted them, at least on some level, while for Sylvanas and Kerrigan, women, it was forced. Looking at the credits, it appears that exactly one woman was working on the game directly, outside of voice acting and QA, which was eventually verified by David Freed. I think the existence of writing choices like this makes a good argument for why such a gender imbalance is a problem. I assume that like me, many people connected with Sylvanas, for she would return in a more major role in the expansion, where she would get at least a bit of justice for what happened to her. More on that in the next video. You're quite a way into the game by now, and you've probably noticed that the undead keep referring to Ne'er as their lord. If you've played Beyond the Dark Portal, you may be wondering why. Last we saw Ne'er he destroyed Draenor and buggered off into the Twisting Nether. While more explanation is put into setting the scene in this game compared to the last two, there are still some details like this that you will need to consult the manual to understand. So let's do that! After escaping Draenor, Nezu was captured by the demon lord Kil'jaeden. Kil'jaeden had originally worked with the warlock Gul'dan to set in motion a plan of launching a demonic invasion upon the world we know. You see, he is one of the leaders of what's called the Burning Legion, a huge demonic army that has a taste for destroying worlds, and it was time to set this one to the flame, as Kel'Thuzad puts it. Kil'jaeden empowered Ner'zhul with the ability to raise an army of the dead, and the knowledge that this was the orc's absolute last chance to pave the way for the Legion's invasion. The Death Knights and Warlocks of old were turned into the Liches and sworn to Ner'zhul's command, while he was plunged into his eternal prison on the desolate continent of Northrend, the Frozen Throne. From that moment on, Ner'zhul would be known as the Lich King. He conquered Northrend and then, through his disciple from Dalaran, Kel'Thuzad, started plans for the downfall of the human kingdoms. 
While this was happening, the surviving orcs in Azeroth were rounded up in internment camps and the humans attempted to rebuild their old kingdoms, which would involve brutally suppressing demi-human uprisings that would hinder them, a glimpse into a darker side of the human alliance. In fact, the whole presentation of the humans and orcs has changed. Compare the grunts and footmen, for instance. Where the footmen used to sound like... Yes, my lord. They now sound like... Aye, my lord. And where the grunts were like... Dabu. They have become... Dabu. We've gone from an overly well-spoken educated man and a dumb brute to just two ordinary lower class warriors. Obviously, they want you to see the orcs in a different light now. We'll see why during their campaign. The manual also introduces virtually every character in the game, but you'll get an understanding of them from the game alone, so it's not needed. Most of what remains is pretty much what happened with Thrall in Lord of Clans that we went over earlier. At the end of the Undead campaign, the Burning Legion has finally begun its invasion, thanks to the Undead summoning the Demon Lord, Archimond, the main villain of the game, and also the dullest one. We're left with the demons pushing the undead aside, and Kel'Thuzad comments that this is fine. It's still according to Ner'zhul's plan. The human kingdoms are now royally fucked, so it is time to jump ship with them and see to the orcs again. Feeling like an age has passed since the prologue campaign where we last saw him, we rejoin Thrall on the shores of Kalimdor, having been separated from his best friend and second-in-command, Grom Hellstream, by a storm. The campaign opens with the orcs getting involved with the locals, which provides a bit of calm after the literal earth-shaking events the Undead campaign took us through. But before long, Thrall and Grom are reunited, and the demons are once again the driving factor of the story. But from the perspective of a people trying to get away from their grasp this time. Thrall represents a new way for the orcs, where they live at peace with nature and the world around them, and overcome their corrupted bloodlust. Whereas Grom represents the urge to kill, destroy, and return to what the Horde has been for years. You get to play with both of them separately to see their perspectives, and divorcing us from the previous structure of just having one protagonist, for two whole campaigns no less. Grom is once again tempted by the demon's influence, and once again falls to it. Thrall in the meantime seeks out an oracle to help him discover a future that is brighter for his people. It turns out, for this future, he needs to rescue Grom and confront the darkness that corrupted their race so long ago. This campaign is simply brilliant. The story is very strong, driven both by high stakes building in the background and personal stakes for our two heroes, both of whom are very likeable for different reasons. Thrall because he's something of an everyman, but also a compelling leader balancing strength and charisma to a T. Grom, because despite some bad decisions he's made, he's been used by forces far greater than him for god knows how long, but even with their influence you can see that he has a good side and you root for it to win out. It culminates in the emotional high point of the whole franchise where Grom gives his life to end the demonic blood haze that has imprisoned the orcs since before they laid foot in Azeroth. Thrall was trying to save the Horde for the whole campaign, but in the end, it turned out Grom was the one who could actually do it. You can view this whole thing as a final statement about how the Orcs should be seen in the world now. Saying this one more time, Orcs are no longer just evil, and humans are no longer just good. I very much doubt it is coincidence that the human campaign is a tale of corruption, and the Orc campaign is one of redemption. The campaign strengths are not just apparent in the writing, the gameplay has had a clear upgrade as well. When making the campaign, they designed the maps roughly in chronological order, which means that they were still working out the kinks in the early stages. But by now, they seem to have really hit their stride. The maps not only offer a greater range of unique scenarios, but they are well structured to incentivize different strategic approaches. On one map, you will want to rush your attacks so that you don't get swarmed by too many players attacking you at once. Another sets you up perfectly for a playstyle of slipping raiders into a base, destroying a building or two and slipping out again, and another again will encourage you to take your fight to the air. I use these as examples because the game actually guides you to them via optional objectives, functioning to suggest a strategy while still letting you figure out what is best for yourself. Unfortunately, there is one major drawback. The balance scheme. There are actually three different balances in Warcraft 3. There's a word that sounds wrong in plural. 
They are the Online Balance, the Frozen Throne Campaign Balance, and the Reign of Chaos Campaign Balance. The first two are pretty similar, with the most important variation being the Griffin Riders and Frostworms do piercing damage in one, and magic damage in the other. The Reign of Chaos balance, though, is quite different in a number of ways. Most obvious would be that certain units and tools are missing from each tech tree. The second most obvious would be the change in upkeep food cutoffs I mentioned earlier. But one other thing to keep in mind is that the counter system is very different too. Certain armor and damage types didn't exist in Reign of Chaos. For instance, there was no hero damage. In Reign of Chaos, heroes just did normal damage, which made them obscenely good against light armored units. I bring this up now because I think in Reign of Chaos Balance, the Orcs have by far the short end of the stick. To start with, air units are very difficult to deal with for the Orcs. They just don't have any strong units that effectively counter the sky. This was over-addressed in the expansion, but that doesn't mean it's not a problem. Next, Raiders, a vital unit to the Orcs playstyle, have heavy armor, meaning that they take extra damage from piercing attacks, and therefore a unit called Raider sucks at raiding because even one tower will keep them right away from any town. The spell Slow is very, very strong versus your army since they lack speed scrolls and the disenchant spell to counter it, and no healing salves means that orcs can't sort out their injured units in the early game at all. Luckily, the excellent level design once again comes to the rescue, at least to a small extent, with generous use of fountains and shops, but unfortunately the issue still pops its head out here and there. Come the end of the Orc campaign, we still haven't fought the Burning Legion directly at all. The Orcs have broken free of them, but the invasion is still going on and will soon reach Kalimdor. So one more campaign is needed for that final battle, the campaign of the Night Elves. Sadly, they suffer from what I call Protoss Syndrome, meaning they have largely been irrelevant up to this point and now must find a way to work themselves into a story that has mostly operated alright without them. To put this in perspective, before their campaign they had about equal prominence in the narrative as the Centaurs, acting as a one-off faction for a couple of missions where the existing ones weren't appropriate. Furthermore, there's not a whole lot of time given to establish what is normal for them, like we did for the humans and even to an extent the Orcs. We just jump straight into facing a world-ending threat virtually immediately. For these reasons, I find it hard to connect with the Night Elves' culture and struggles compared to the other races, so for the sake of learning a bit more about them, let's open the manual again. 10,000 plus years ago, the Night Elves were the dominant people of this world. At the time, there was but one continent, and at its center, a mystical lake known as the Well of Eternity. Many Night Elves, especially the Highborn, studied the lake and from it drew a primitive form of magic, but it came at a cost. The Burning Legion was able to corrupt several of them through such magic and warp their will to make preparations for their first invasion all those years ago, just as the Orcs and Undead were used this time. The Night Elves, with the help of several other creatures of the world, destroyed the Well of Eternity, putting a stop to the first invasion and ending their own civilization as they knew it in the process. Side effect, it blew the continent apart into the configuration we have now. The Night Elves embraced their new place in the world, drawing their power from nature rather than the arcane arts, and the remaining Highborn were banished from their society to eventually become the High Elves of Quel'Thalas. However, there was one whose addiction to the magic of old was too strong, the betrayer, Illidan. He created a new Well of Eternity using the waters from the old, and for his sins he was sentenced to forever be imprisoned underground. To pacify the new lake, the Dragon Queen Alexstrasza planted a great tree atop it. The World Tree. I think more of this information should have made it into the game itself for the sake of fleshing out the Night Elves a little more, but at least as far as the plot is concerned you should understand what you need to without reading the manual. Except one thing, the part about Illidan. In game his crimes are kept vague as hell, but his brother Furion is adamant that he is beyond redemption. With the knowledge from the manual in mind, maybe it's fair that Furion takes this attitude. Recreating the Well of Eternity was an egregious crime, no doubt. But even then, Illidan's motive is clearly not about controlling people or demonic sympathies. He just has a problem with addiction. A problem he is still struggling with now. I wonder why. 
Are you telling me that ostracizing people from society and locking them in a dark box for millennia doesn't work? Wow, I would never have guessed. When Uladin was finally set free, he found and consumed the skull of Gul'dan to gain its power for himself, still feeding that hunger for magic. Despite holding a lot of frustration and anger towards his own people, he did not use it against them. He instead put it to killing the demon leading the undead and starting the healing process for Ashenvale Forest. Maybe it was still wrong to tamper with that power, despite how it was used. There's room for debate there, but Illidan does not appear ill-intentioned in this. Not pure intentioned either, but certainly not ill. If it is decided that Gul'dan's magic is beyond controlling, then one should acknowledge that he tried to do the right thing within the boundaries enforced by his cravings, and assistance should be offered to help him find another way. After all, he did give it up once before. When Tyrande gave him patience and support during the first invasion, he was able to leave magic behind, for a little while at least. But no, Furion would not hear it and exiled him from the forest, fomenting his own brother as an outcast. Furion, you absolute fuck. Granted, it's not necessarily a problem that Furion can't accept his brother if it is interpreted as a character flaw. My issue is I can't shake the feeling that the game thinks I'm on his side. When the arc gets started, our heroes have just encountered Illidan's prison and start debating about the merits and costs of freeing him. Furion opposes the idea while his girlfriend, Tyrande, believes Illidan can be given another chance to help fight the Legion. Tyrande gets her way for now, but come the end of the arc, she is swayed to Furion's point of view by what Illidan does. The model appears to be to show one party how their worldview will fail to demonstrate it as wrong. This is fine if used properly, but... well, it wasn't. If they wanted to use this technique, then Illidan should have actively made the situation worse. But as is, he most certainly does the opposite. It's just that he may have used something that he shouldn't have to do so. That's a setup for an ethical query, not a hardline conclusion. Yet the evolution of Tyrande's point of view just doesn't mesh well with the query idea. That's aside from the message itself, which appears to be addicts and or criminals are not worth helping. They will just cause more damage if you try. And I think that's a pretty rubbish moral to have at the best of times. Mind you, maybe the writing is more conscious of the nuance than I am giving it credit for, since Furion doesn't come across well in this story, despite being right in its eyes. Him taking a determined stance to ruin someone's life is bad enough, but he also had to be a condescending and controlling prick to Tyrande while he was at it. I'll say this again, Furion, you absolute, dry, lifeless, fuck. So yeah, Illidan's arc is not well written. And to make matters worse, this whole fiasco only lasts for about one and a half levels, which may surprise you considering a story of similar complexity just took the entire Orc campaign to tell. Most of the campaign is simply about getting everyone together to fight the Legion, from the human and Orc newcomers to the old sleeping druids, and frankly, the whole process feels a bit rushed. That might sound odd considering I wanted more time just to set up the Night Elves themselves, which you might think means less time on the events of the plot. In this final campaign alone, yes, that is correct, but my point is the process of preparation should have been going on before this campaign, at least to some extent. That is why it is important to avoid Protoss Syndrome. Hopefully one day that'll be a known phrase. So far, I've been quite harsh on this campaign. It seems that despite introducing new races, the humans and the orcs were still the game at its best. But while this campaign is not as good as theirs, I would put this one above the undeads. In fact, there's a fair amount I really like about it. First, there are once again some pretty sweet maps here. I would say the standard is slightly lower than that of the orc campaign, but we compensate for this because the night elves have some of the best and most interesting mechanics. Stuff like hiding at night, moving buildings, and detonating wisps to drain mana and dispel. The maps are a little too easy to cheese with dryads though, which are absolutely overpowered in Reign of Chaos balance. We go through these maps with the leader of the Night of Sentinels, Tarunda, who is a good character in her own right. She has a calm collected strength to her that we haven't seen in anyone else to this point, and it instantly marks her as a powerful leader. 
At the same time, she is overly pragmatic and judgmental, which holds her back from forming an alliance with the humans and orcs during a time where it is really needed. But by the end of the campaign, she has learned her error and puts her bias aside. It's a shame that the twat face mostly takes over the decision making once he's introduced, and I wish our story with the badass warrior woman was not one where they are made to defer to the judgement of a man. The fact that Tarunda still manages to stand out in these conditions alone tells us that the writing quality was very solid, but overall, Arthas and Thrall both have the edge on her. Beyond doubt, the crowning jewel of this campaign is its final mission. Twilight of the Gods. Just an outstanding piece of design. The Burning Legion is assaulting the World Tree, and the factions we've played through the game so far have come together to defend it. The demon's advance with the undead at side is ruthless and all-dominating. The humans fall first as Archimon mocks them for how easily their home kingdoms were annihilated. Then the orcs as Thrall calls out defiance, reinforcing the Horde's freedom from the Legion. And finally, the Night Elves are slowly overwhelmed in a desperate attempt to find a victory that we don't even know will come, or if it's even possible. It's beautiful that what I've just described is both the gameplay and the story. We see them dancing a perfect waltz, the likes of which is very rarely seen, and my god, it ignites all the sense of desperation and finality that you could ever want or need. It is, in my humble and utterly rubbish opinion, among the best final missions in gaming history. The actual ending is not so superb. They've dug themselves into a corner since the Legion is extremely powerful and they haven't introduced anything that is capable of balancing that back to our side. So they just made a whole bunch of wisps blow Archimond up and called it a day. At some point I thought this might be clever because the wisps detonate ability damages summoned units and Archimond was summoned if you recall the end of the undead campaign. Then I remembered that Archimond is immune to magic so it would have no effect anyway. However, even if he wasn't, that's beside the point. It would still feel like a cop-out because the problem isn't with mechanical fidelity, but with setup and payoff. The idea here was that the Night Elves would give their abilities over nature and immortality back to the world, sacrificing for the greater good what made them powerful and, in their eyes, superior. This is good thematically. The narrative has demonstrated already that treating your own desires as more important than the needs of the world and seeking to further your individual power leads to ruin and suffering, a la Arthas and Grom, and if we ignore the fumbling in the script, Illidan as well. This theme doesn't gel perfectly with the gameplay, where you absolutely should treat your heroes as more important than the rest of your army, but the writing at least is quite clear on this stance. The other side of that is acknowledging that you are no more fit to hold power than these figures and handing it back to the natural order, whatever that may be. The world burns when you are greedy, the world heals when you are humble. That makes sense, good. So how is this side of the theme explored in the campaign? Not well is the answer. It's only brought up in the final level and only afforded two lines of dialogue in total. We should have been talking about these ideas in the first or second map, and built up from there to climax and conclude them at the ending, rather than first introducing them at that moment. Doing so would not only have expressed the theme better, but many of the other flaws could have been fixed in the process. We could position Furion as understanding that their power needed to be given back from the start, Illidan could take the other side and say that it must be used to its fullest against the Legion, and Tarunda is uncertain at first, but ultimately it is her who must decide who is right. And bang! Furion is not lashing out in prejudice, but has a real argument in this version, so, provided they also make his dialogue less wanky, he's no longer an insufferable git. Illidan can still be sympathetic, but we understand that his way is wrong, which will make the tragedy of his eventual exile hit harder, but also smoothly follow from the events of the plot. And Tarunda is still the character with agency over what must be done, so Furion doesn't usurp her position as protagonist in this layout either. That's planting and payoff, that's exploring the theme, that's personal drama, that is what it should have been. Fuck, I didn't notice those rhymed until I was editing. I'm a poet, and I didn't realize. There is one more loose thread that's lacking a payoff. 
Well, sort of. Well, no, actually. It's paid off, but I think it could have been better. However, instead of just talking this time, let's have some fun in the world editor. The Scourge is finished with you, demon. <laughs> Celebrate, Victors. This is your moment, after all. We'll meet again. Not sure if that's any good, really. Still, I'm not going to elaborate further, so hopefully it speaks for itself. I'm noticing writing these scripts that it is much easier to go on for a long time about what is wrong with a game over what it does well, but speaking from the overall experience of the ending, the strengths of the final mission are easily dominant over any and all flaws that I've outlined here. Furthermore, yeah, Sakimon's death is dumb, but the cinematic continues after that and still manages to finish with a strong foot forward. The Prophet, while overlooking the now united peoples resting and celebrating, gives a speech about how both they and nature itself rose up to meet the challenges that faced them. Through the whole story, the Prophet did not act as a leader, but as a teacher. For once again, authority and power are not the answer and that very wisdom will be his legacy. And now that it was done, the time had come for him to give up his own power and take his place in history. Absolutely inspirational and beautiful. Oh, and the prophet is Medivh for some reason. If there's any game in this series you'll want to play more of, it's Warcraft 3. And let's say you don't want to play the expansion yet for whatever reason. What do you do? The same answers as the previous games still apply, multiplayer, custom content, etc. But now you also have the option of playing the campaign again on hard mode. The difference between normal and hard is quite substantial. The enemy attacks often contain twice as many units, if not more. They also come earlier, they come more often and with more powerful heroes to boot. It does feel like there should have been a difficulty level between these two, but there isn't. So if you're keen to give it a try, then this is probably the time to start getting used to hotkeys. This is hyper intimidating at first. It's easy to look at the sheer number of hotkeys in these games and just say nope right there. But I really do think it is worth it. I could never have imagined how much better they make the game feel before I started using them. But once you do, there is no going back. But let's not jump too far in the deep end. The first piece of advice is never to feel like they are necessary. Try to use them, but if you can't remember one in a moment, don't worry about it. You've still got your mouse. When getting started, focus on just a few. 
I'd start with A for attacking and attack moving, space to instantly go to your previous alert so you can quickly react, and shift to Q commands. You'll find once you're comfortable with that, you'll slowly start adding more to your arsenal quite naturally. Which brings me to my final piece of advice. Customize them. Or at least use grid hotkeys, because the default ones in this game are sorta of stupid. Whose idea was that? Warcraft 3 does not have an internal hotkey editor, but one can be found online or with W3 champions. You can then enable them from the in-game options menu. Before we finish up, there are two more quick hints I want to slip in here to help you play better if you're new to the game. First, head into the options menu and enable always show status bars. With this, you won't have to select your units to see their life or mana. It makes the game a lot more playable if you don't waste APM selecting them to find this information. Second, once in game, click this button to disable formations. It's a bloody pain to micro your units when they keep insisting on finding their place in the ranks before they go anywhere. A good feature in Age of Empires to help with pathing of large armies, but not right in a game more about micromanagement. Warcraft 3's ending wraps things up marvellously for Medivh and the Legion's invasion, but as before, the universe has grown too big to be completely finished by this stage. Many of the characters still seem to have something to offer, and plenty of questions about what comes next remain. By now, Blizzard had established a pattern of releasing an expansion to their games after about a year. Considering that Warcraft 3 sold like fucking nuts, this was going to be no exception. Besides, it really felt like it was time to give the grand heroes and devious villains a rest, and start focusing on those characters in between. Let's see what they could really do when they were given the spotlight.